And I'm Mary Krogan, your provost and executive vice chancellor here at UC Davis. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the first event in the 2021-22 season of the UC Davis Forums on the Public University and the Social Good. We are very happy that after a full season of exclusively virtual events, we're now able to offer today's forum in person. I wanna thank everyone here for coming out. At the same time, in order to make this season's presentations more accessible, we are also live streaming all five of our 2021-22 forums. So I also wanna thank everyone who's joining us by Zoom for being here for the event. So the UC Davis Forums was established in 2012 by our former provost and executive vice chancellor, Ralph Hexter, whom you will hear from very soon. Each academic year, we present about a half dozen lectures by experts from a range of disciplines. The series is unique in its purpose. It seeks to promote informed and thoughtful dialogue among members of the campus community and the public on the following subjects. The major challenges facing the public university, ways of responding to those challenges, and how the public university is evolving. Seeking to help the public university best serve society and individuals, this series poses the following question. What should and can the public university be in the 21st century? In our preceding nine seasons, the UC Davis Forums has presented distinguished speakers on a wide range of topics pertaining to the public university and the social good. These have included educational access and affordability, sexism and racism in the academy, and the relationship between academic mission and neoliberal metrics of success, among many other topics. Looking ahead, you won't want to miss our next event, which will feature Professor Stella Flores on January 20th. You can find information about all of this season's forums, along with descriptions and videos of past events on the series website, forums.ucdavis.edu. For this afternoon's forum, we are very delighted to welcome as our featured speaker, Professor Brian Socek, Professor of Law and Chancellor's Fellow at our own UC Davis School of Law. The title of his talk is Academic Freedom, Dangers and Distractions. Immediately following his presentation, there will be a Q&A period. Before Professor Hexter formally introduces our speaker, I want to take a moment to thank the following individuals and groups who have made this event possible. The UC Davis Forum Steering Committee, led by Martin Kenney, who is a Distinguished Professor of Community and Regional Development in Human Ecology. The other members of the committee are Professors Raquel Aldana, Scott Carell, Marcella Quellar, Jonathan Eisen, Ralph Hexter, Maisha Wynn, and Mark Yarborough. The Community and Regional Development Program in the Department of Human Ecology is to be thanked. They've joined the Office of the Provost in sponsoring this event. Everyone in our audience, I'd like to thank you for making time out of your busy schedules to join us today. And with greatest appreciation, Professor Socek for sharing your knowledge, your insights on an important and timely topic related to the public university. Now I will yield the podium to Ralph Hexter. Thank you, Provost Krogan. It's a very great honor and pleasure for me to introduce Professor Brian Socek, and also a bit unfair to Professor Socek, since I am not one of his colleagues at the King's School of Law, any one of whom could no doubt do greater justice to his merits as a legal scholar. I will say that one of the great satisfaction of being provost at UC Davis, and I trust that Provost Krogan is discovering this on a daily basis, is becoming aware of the depth, breadth, and excellence of our faculty. 
I remember being impressed by Professor Socek's academic achievements the first time I read about them, likely in a personnel file. Now, impressed is too mild a term, awestruck. Professor Socek received his BA summa cum laude in philosophy and economics from Boston College and then earned a PhD in philosophy at Columbia University where he won the core preceptor prize for his teaching in Columbia's famous humanities sequence. Before going on to law school, Professor Socek taught for three years in the humanities collegiate division and philosophy department at the University of Chicago where he was also co-chair of the Society of Fellows in the Liberal Arts. You can see why I recognize in Professor Socek a fellow humanist and one of rare caliber. Not that lawyers are not humanists, of course. <laughs> Professor Socek earned his JD in 2011 from Yale Law School, whose dean, Robert Post, an emigre from UC Berkeley, is also an expert on academic freedom and was, in fact, a speaker in, on that topic in this very series in 2014. Professor Socek distinguished himself as a law student at Yale, serving as comments editor for the Yale Law Journal and winning the Munson Prize for his work in the school's immigration clinic. After clerking for the late Mark R. Kravitz, judge of the District of Connecticut and the Honorable Guido Calabrese of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, in 2013, Professor Socek joined the faculty of the School of Law at UC Davis, where he is now as Provost said, a Chancellor's Fellow. Professor Socek has published extensively, but the impact of his scholarship extends far beyond the journals. His work on free speech and, equ and equality law has been cited by the U.S. Supreme Court in the Sixth and Seventh Circuits, referenced and excerpted in leading case books in immigration law, civil procedure, and sexual orientation law, discussed by the Wall Street Journal and honored with a Duke and Menier Award from UCLA's Williams uh, Institute on Sexual Orientation and Gender for the year's best article on sexual orientation and gender identity law. This is such important work and we are all in Professor Socek's debt for his powerful defense of the rights of all persons. Equality work he does through not simply articles and briefs but public speaking and advocacy. As you can tell, I'm an admirer. Among the many reasons for my admiration is the fact that Professor Socek has continued to work and publish in philosophy and aesthetics. He's currently a trustee of the American Society for Aesthetics. There are not many of his publications I'm qualified to comment on, but one is Giovanni of Naxos on Mozart's Don Giovanni, published in a collection of essays on that opera in 2006, a fascinating, learned, and important discussion, not only of Da Ponte and Mozart's Don Giovanni and its genesis and performance history, but the genesis and performance history of Ariadne of Naxos by Hugo von Hofmannsthal and Richard Strauss. Out of the juxtaposition of these two works, Professor Socek's legal and aesthetic mind draws provocative thoughts on what fidelity and authenticity to a work of art means and has meant over 200 years of operatic performing tradition. Those who know me well know we are at a perilous juncture. This could be the launching pad for a digression without end, but I turn dutifully and enthusiastically to our topic today. No one is better qualified to speak to us on academic freedom than Professor Socek, who has chaired the Committee on Academic Freedom and Responsibility of the Davis Division of the Academic Senate and is currently chair of the University of California System-wide Committee on Academic Freedom as well as fellow of UC's National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. Academic freedom is central to the functioning of the kind of university we are and very much hope to remain. And while academic freedom has been assailed and assaulted at many times and from a variety of quarters, no one doubts that it is under extreme pressure today. Just this morning I read in Inside Higher Education that the University of Florida has banned three of its faculty from participating in a lawsuit uh, against the state of Florida over its recent law restricting voting access. Obviously, the administration of the university thinks it is acting within its rights. What else can one expect of an administration? And no doubt will be litigated. 
Perhaps uh, Professor Sochek has views on this that he will share in his remarks, which we're all eager to hear. Following his talk, uh, I will moderate a question and answer period. Lest my introduction, however, be felt too obsequious, I want to register that Professor Sochek and I have not always agreed. As one might expect, our debate was over an opera. We had rather different takes on the composer John Adams' latest opera, Girls of the Golden West, which we both saw during its world premiere run in 2017 at San Francisco Opera. I will not embarrass him further, but I will quote from an email that was part of our exchange. I'm very much with you in wanting to find what's best in the work. I've always been devoted to Ronald Dworkin's view of interpretation as the attempt to read the work in the way that makes it the best work it can be, a principle so central to his own thinking that it features in his article on Mozart and Strauss. Let us now all then attend to Professor Socek with what I like to term interpretive charity, though I suspect little charity will be called for given his sovereign command of the topic as of all topics that he touches on. Professor Socek. Well, that was very nice. Uh, it is such an honor to be with you here today uh, and all of you on the camera. Uh, I'm especially grateful and just gratified to be giving a talk as part of this series after having gone to so many of the other talks in this series. Uh, it's especially daunting being tasked with saying something about academic freedom, having myself come and heard earlier talks on the subject at the forum by people like Judith Butler and John Zimmerman and my very own First Amendment teacher, Robert Post. Now, I've actually just finished my time as chair of the University of California's Committee on Academic Freedom. And although I don't intend my talk today to be specifically about the University of California in particular, the academic freedom dangers and distractions that I mean to focus on are ones that in the current moment affect or are thought to affect uh, even institutions like ours. That's to say, I'm not going to be focused, or I'm only passingly going to be focused, on the grave threats to academic freedom that keep arising in states around the country where legislators, legislatures are working to end or limit tenure, or to control or surveil discussions of critical race theory or other so-called divisive concepts in their state schools, or the example that is just ongoing in Florida, as Ralph mentioned. I certainly won't be talking about the very grave dangers, even physical dangers, that scholars face in other countries around the world. My topic is an admittedly privileged one, for I'm asking about academic freedom challenges that arise not in other places out there, where the material conditions or the political commitments necessary to maintain academic freedom might be lacking. I'm asking about here and places like here, where despite our commitments to academic freedom, and despite our relatively favorable material conditions, academic freedom is still regularly seen to be under serious threat. My thesis today is that some of these threats, some of the threats that are seen, are not nearly as bad as others which aren't standardly seen as threats at all. So my plan is to talk about three academic freedom distractions and three or maybe three and a half academic freedom dangers. The threats I'm calling dangers are at once more pervasive but less often addressed in comparison to those I'm lumping together as distractions. I'm gonna start with a distraction and it's one that hits close to home both here at Davis and in my own work. To show it as an academic freedom distraction requires showing what academic freedom means. Once we have in hand a better conception of what academic freedom protects, I hope we'll be able to see more clearly what academic freedom needs protection from. So, let's plunge in. This is my ninth year as a faculty member at UC Davis. And during that time, only one issue has led to a faculty-wide resolution and vote. That issue, in fact, led to two faculty-wide resolutions and votes. The first, which was narrowly defeated, would have resolved that, quote, diversity, equity, and inclusion statements shall not be mandatory for the appointment or for the advancement of faculty. The second, which passed by a somewhat larger margin, resolved that, quote, statements describing contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusion 
are a useful part of a holistic review in the appointment of new faculty. Now across the University of California, as at many of our peer schools too, campuses require DEI, or what I'll call diversity statements, from all faculty applicants. Most of UC's 10 campuses now also ask for diversity statements from current faculty when we apply for tenure or advancement. In recent years, some campuses, including this one, have experimented with targeted searches. Uh, in a recent ad, we aim to attract, quote, leading research faculty with a strong commitment to teaching research and service that will promote the success of underrepresented minority students, parentheses, African American, Latino, Chicano, and Hispanic, and Native American, close paren, and address the needs of our increasingly diverse state. Davis conducted eight of these searches in 2018, 2019. And as part of that process, the search committees tried out a procedural experiment. We looked first at candidates' anonymized diversity statements, scored them, and then considered the full files only of candidates who passed that threshold test. Diversity statements have thus been used, albeit very differently, both in narrowly targeted and in more universalized ways within the UC statement. And critics have definitely noticed, although they haven't always noticed the distinctions between those two uses. In late 2018, uh, right after UCLA announced that it would start requiring diversity statements across the board, both in hiring and advancement, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which is a leading campus free speech advocacy organization, released a statement claiming that UCLA's policy, quote, has the potential to seriously threaten academic freedom at UCLA. Linking to that statement, the former dean of Harvard's medical school took to Twitter to agree. He said, as a dean of a major academic institution, I could not have said this, but I will now. Requiring such statements and applications for appointments and promotions is an affront to academic freedom and diminishes the true value of diversity, equity, and inclusion by trivializing it. Soon after that, Dean Flyer expanded his tweet into a full-blown essay in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Meanwhile, critics both inside and outside UC, uh, from a department chair here at UC Davis, writing in the Wall Street Journal, to George Will, writing in the Washington Post, alleged that UC's use of diversity statements constituted unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination, a political litmus test, even a return to the loyalty oaths of the Cold War era. Recently, conservative legal organizations have openly recruited plaintiffs to sue UC on these grounds. And these were the points that got repeated time and time again in the debate over the dueling faculty resolutions here at UC Davis. One critic says that policies like UC's require professors to affirm specific assumptions about bias, race, gender, other group identities. This is no different from requiring that instructors demonstrate their belief in patriotism or empiricism or biological determinism. Those may be perfectly valid intellectual viewpoints, but viewpoints may not be imposed at a public institution and should not be imposed by any institution devoted to academic freedom. Now, these are all distinctly legal claims, claims about viewpoint discrimination or academic freedom policies. They're legal claims, even when they're made on Twitter or in blog posts. I'm a lawyer, as you've heard, and this is a subject on which I have a lot to say. In fact, I have an 85-page article coming out in the UC Davis Law Review soon about this. But I'm going to give you the short version, specifically as it relates to academic freedom. First, despite how often it is said, the claim that at public universities, viewpoint discrimination in hiring violates the First Amendment is just not true. Hiring meetings are nothing but debates over which candidates' interests and arguments are better than others. That's content and viewpoint discrimination, respectively. To evaluate a tenure file, for that matter, to grade an exam, is to evaluate the quality of the views expressed there. I just finished grading 79 blue books, and viewpoint discrimination happened in every single one of them. Robert Post, who, as you've heard, was one of my predecessors in this lecture series, has at one point summed up what we really mean when we say that viewpoint discrimination is prohibited at schools subject to the First Amendment. Imagine, he says, a chemistry department that awards research grants only to students who oppose abortion rights. 
Although we might be tempted to say the department's criteria for awarding grants are outrageously viewpoint discriminatory, what we would actually mean is that the criteria are completely irrelevant to any legitimate educational objective of the department. Dean Post is right, not just theoretically, but doctrinally as well. When we shift, though, from sloganistic talk about prohibited viewpoint discrimination to more helpful talk about what considerations are relevant to a department's legitimate educational objectives, we really reorient the whole debate. I mean, a moment ago, I quoted diversity statements being analogized to patriotism statements. Both were said, and it's true, to be equally viewpoint discriminatory. But what we should be asking instead is whether faculty's contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusion are as irrelevant to their job description as contributions to patriotism would surely be. In the various critiques, this is something that's often more, this is more often assumed than argued for. We're told that contributions to diversity, quote, have little or no relationship to a faculty member's pedagogical or scholarly duties, or that by considering diversity contributions before other parts of the application, we're weeding people out, quote, before considering their academic qualifications. This is just question begging. It doesn't tell us why an applicant's demonstrated success in reaching a diverse set of students or speaking to the concerns of a diverse audience is not an academic qualification or part of their pedagogical or scholarly duties. A better question here is, who's to decide whether it's relevant or not? Who's to decide what counts as an academic qualification or a pedagogical or scholarly duty within a given field? If our concern isn't just viewpoint discrimination per se, but relevance, the question of what is relevant and who's to decide that suddenly becomes central. And this is where we get to academic freedom. For as I see it, and this view is hardly unique to me, the fundamental principle of academic freedom is that questions like these are to be answered not by administrators or regents or legislators or donors or the public at large. Decisions about what has pedagogical and scholarly value within a field are to be made by the disciplinary experts within that field. To say it again, and not for the last time today, decisions about whether a scholar's teaching and research efforts are relevant and valuable are to be made by her disciplinary peers, not outsiders who lack the necessary expertise. So what does this mean for diversity statements and the threat that they're alleged to pose to academic freedom? My claim isn't that the threat is illusory, but that it's avoidable. Asking a scholar, about their contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusion needn't be categorically any different than asking them about and judging their scholarly and pedagogical contributions more broadly. Our principles of academic freedom have something to say about how that's supposed to be done. For one thing, what counts as a valuable contribution has to be established internally by disciplinary experts within the field. The rubrics for judging a diversity statement can't be imposed from above and nor should they be applied indiscriminately across disciplines. We would never think that such a thing could be done when it comes to evaluating teaching and research generally. Neither should it happen here, then. Most of the academic freedom critiques that get lodged against mandatory diversity statements turn out to be ones that would be equally applicable to any other form of peer review. So yes, academics have to submit themselves to judgment. Yes, it's mandatory. Yes, it can go horribly wrong when factions form within a department or maybe an entire field, when self-interest or friendships or laziness or bias clouds judgments, when disciplinary experts turn into reactionary cartels. Faculty set in their ways may often fail to give fair consideration to dissenting or outsider views. Viewpoints and backgrounds on the faculty may become self-perpetuating. Note. Nothing I have just said is unique to the evaluation of contributions to diversity. In fact, it's the very critique I read from people on the left, from minority faculty who say that these are the exact problems they face, from women faculty and others. These are problems endemic to a system in which faculty are hired, granted tenure, and given promotions and raises, based almost entirely on the judgment of their peers. The solution is better, more conscientious peer review, 
something to which I'll return, not some other system in which the relevance and works worth of academics' teaching and research contributions are judged by someone other than their disciplinary peers. Now, a critic might still say that our institutional priorities are overly focused on diversity, or perhaps on too narrow a conception of diversity. Is this an academic freedom problem? Well, on the one hand, no. Because, of course, there's any number of institutional priorities that I might disagree with as a faculty member. I might think my institution devotes too many resources to sports or to sciences at the expense of the humanities or to out-of-state students rather than Californians or vice versa. Is my academic freedom violated because I don't get my way there? I would say no unless faculty are denied a voice in the system of shared governance that leads to the setting of these priorities. And this point has one really important implication for diversity statements. If faculty participation in shared governance is to be protected, then the beliefs of individual faculty members about institutional priorities cannot be dictated to them by the institution. Put simply, I can be told to advance certain institutional priorities, to do my job in other words, but not to believe and profess my belief that those priorities are the right ones. When it comes to diversity statements, we should thus be asking what faculty have done or plan to do to contribute to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We should emphatically not be asking faculty to say how strongly they believe in those values. Again, think of the analogy with teaching statements. We ask about your success in the classroom, not about how important you think teaching is. As a result, faculty can write a top-notch teaching statement even if they believe and go out and argue in op-eds or in the faculty senate that their institution places way too much emphasis on teaching at the expense of their research. To sum this whole first point up, and I promise the other five points aren't as long, mandated diversity statements are not a threat to academic freedom if and only if, first, they're judged by disciplinary experts within one's field using standards that are tailored to that field and the job at issue. And second, if they're framed in a way that protects the intellectual freedom of those making the statements, giving faculty space, whether as citizens or participants in shared governance, to dissent without self-contradiction. These are the requirements because academic freedom means that decisions about what gets valued at a university should come from communities of disciplinary experts within the university, not mandated by administration, much less outsourced to outside parties. Okay, with academic freedom so defined, I hope you'll understand why I think that diversity statements for all the fuss is an academic freedom distraction that can be avoided if we do them right. But I also hope that you'll now understand what I see as a much larger, more threatening danger. And that is US News and World Report. <laughs> I am in no way kidding when I say that from where I stand, US News, the defunct news magazine with the sadly non-defunct annual ratings, rankings publication, is one of the most pervasive and fundamental threats to academic freedom in American higher education. I can think of no other way in which universities' decisions about who will teach, who will be taught, what they will be taught, and how they will be taught, what Justice Frankfurter, quoting South African scholars, famously referred to as the four essential freedoms of a university, I know of no other way in which the exercise of those freedoms have been so, has been so thoroughly outsourced. In saying this, I'm not just meaning to repeat well-known arguments about the pernicious effect university rankings have had and continue to have, the way they entrench inequalities, perpetuate privilege, homogenize the landscape of higher ed. I won't rehearse these arguments because they've been made so devastatingly by so many others. My concern here is not specifically with what educational values U.S. News privileges or how specifically it distorts which students get admitted, what faculty get hired, and where money gets spent at American universities. My point is just to observe how shocking it is and how egregious a violation of academic freedom it is 
that a private company like US News would be given any role at all in the making of these decisions. To suggest the kind of decisions a ranking scheme might affect, we might just look at the factors that were considered in this year's college rankings, as well as the factors at play in the field I know best, the law. Both rankings, for example, give weight to standardized tests and, to a lesser extent, grades. SAT, ACT scores currently count for 5% of the college rankings. Median LSAT and GRE scores make up 11% of a law school's rank. If more than half the applicants at a test-optional college decide not to submit scores, the school gets docked 15% in this category. Schools that don't consider standardized tests are penalized even more. Now, some of the inputs measure things that I personally really like. When it comes to law rankings, I'm much happier being judged on our school's bar passage rate, 2.25%. Uh, that's not our passage rate. That's how much it goes into the US News ranking. Uh, than by our peer assessment score, which counts for more than 10 times that much. I spent two years as the law school's most newly tenured faculty member, which is one of the categories of peer voters in the law school rankings and I have never gotten so much mail in my life. It's a horrible system. On the college list, I'm glad that US News has finally started looking at the number of Pell Grant recipients that schools are enrolling and how they're doing compared to classmates from wealthier families. On the other hand, I'm less excited about the fact that alumni giving makes up 3% of the college scores or that the average salary of full-time faculty counts for 7%, although that's an admission against self-interest. To be clear, my point is not that peer review scores are junk, though they are, and the point is not that I like the way US News distorts admissions priorities, but I dislike the way it distorts faculty hiring. The point is that admissions and faculty hiring priorities are being distorted at all by the crew of decidedly non-disciplinary experts that happen to work at US News. It's amazing to me, those worked up about the fact that administrators might be putting a pro-diversity thumb on the scale when it comes to faculty hiring and advancement priorities, my 427 colleagues who voted against our use of DEI statements, I'm surprised that they're not more vocally outraged that a private company with no educational expertise whatsoever and certainly no accountability might be putting its thumb in our academic affairs on a far greater scale. But some might think this is different. U.S. News isn't telling anybody what to teach or study. U.S. News compiles statistics. It doesn't compel loyalty oaths. U.S. News isn't out there getting faculty members fired or investigated. On this view, U.S. News might be bad for higher ed, but it's not a menace to academic freedom. I think that's wrong. For one thing, I think that view relies on a common but misguided view of academic freedom as a right of certain individuals to do what they want. It's free speech for academics. I've already explained what I think is a better view. Investigations and firings are just limit cases of a far more pervasive activity that happens every day in universities. We evaluate research and teaching and student achievement. We decide what to reward, what to tolerate, and what to deem unsatisfactory or even beyond the pale. Academic freedom isn't freedom from this judgment. It's freedom from being evaluated by the wrong judges. Evaluations are the lifeblood of the university, and those evaluations just can't be outsourced. And look at how they're being outsourced here. US News might not be telling anyone what to teach or research, but it's nonetheless shaping universities' choices about what gets taught and who gets taught and by whom. At the law school, I have certainly never been told to make a teaching or research or hiring or admissions decision with an eye to our US News rankings. In faculty meetings and in the press, my dean de-emphasizes the rankings as much as he possibly can without ignoring them entirely. And yet, I have to wonder what our student body would look like if we could choose without external penalty not to care about median LSAT scores. If GPAs weren't getting scored, would we end up with more students from the sciences or other majors that have traditionally lower grade point averages? Would our students have chosen a more challenging curriculum as undergrads? Would we maybe have more faculty in the law school who are teaching California-specific law, California civil procedure, California constitutional law? 
important as those topics are, scholarship on them has a more limited audience and less impact on peer review scores than their federal law counterparts. I'm sure similar questions could be asked in every other school and department. The effect of rankings, the perniciousness of outside in interference, this just doesn't get called out as an academic freedom concern. To see this, just consider uh, the University of Chicago, which is widely seen, certainly seen by itself, as having the strongest commitment to free speech and academic freedom of any university in the country. At Chicago, free speech is an export industry. Campaigns are waged across the country even now to get other universities to sign on to the so-called Chicago Statement on Free Expression, which was released in 2015. Over 80 other schools have signed on since. Just this summer, the University of Virginia became one of the latest. The statement, the Chicago Statement, repeats the conclusion of the famous 1967 Calvin Committee report at Chicago which argued that institutional positions on political or social issues are incompatible with the academic freedom of people within the institution. Chicago and its many followers, this university not among them, sees its faculty as snowflakes whose independence of thought might melt away should their institution express a view different from theirs. But even with these commitments, these vocal and self-satisfied commitments to academic freedom, Chicago is still willing to outsource fundamental academics decisions to US News. Take admissions. At least when I taught at Chicago 15 years ago, building its distinctively quirky, idea-loving, kind of intense student body was seen as so central to the university's character that all faculty members were asked to read undergraduate admissions files. Chicago prided itself on refusing to join the Common App the application form used by most universities in the US. Instead, it had the Uncommon app, which asked quirky questions meant to suss out the uniqueness of the students applying and to communicate Chicago's own uniqueness. Here's Chicago's then Dean of Admissions, Ted O'Neill, describing what happened. Those of us who worked in the admissions office at Chicago were happy with what we were getting. Relatively fewer applications, but better, more informed, more targeted applications. But that isn't enough these days. Presidents and boards of trustees want more, better targeted or not. And eventually word came that we must abandon the uncommon. Those of us were there lamented its passing. But now, only 8% of applicants to the University of Chicago are admitted, which is a kind of triumph, I guess. In fact, in, 20, in 2008, the last year of the uncommon app, Chicago's admit rate was around 28%. Three years earlier, it had been around 40%. Three years after the change, it had fallen to 16%, then 13 then 8 and down to its current rate of 6% of applicants getting in. Not coincidentally, Chicago's US News ranking during that period rose from around 8th or 9th in the country up to 3rd. Well, US News has now stopped using admit rates in its college rankings. Now, social mobility has been emphasized instead. So perhaps we'll start seeing Chicago start deciding that Pell Grant recipients are what their class really needs. Chicago's currently ranked 327th on the US News social mobility ranking. If they do so, of course, it will be because US News made that a priority. And that's the point of all of this. Just to offer a contrast case, last year, people were outraged and Fox News literally ran stories about the fact that the faculty of the English department at Chicago decided that that year they would be prioritizing consideration of applicants who work in and with black studies for admission to the PhD program during the 2020-2021 admission cycle. That's not the academic freedom danger here. That's not outsiders meddling with admission standards and values. Okay, I've offered you a distraction, diversity statements, and a more serious danger, US News. And in doing so, I've laid out my test for what academic freedom requires and consequently what endangers it. Academic freedom, to say it again, requires that the teaching and research activities within a university 
be judged by communities of disciplinary experts, not by outsiders who lack the relevant expertise. So my next two paired topics both involve examples where non-experts are evaluating teaching and or research within a university. But I'm gonna call one a distraction and one a danger, and do so not because they differ in kind, but because institutional responses to them have so far been way more protective ac academic freedom in one example than the other. So the distraction, the distraction consists of the various actions by students and the public at large that we refer to as cancel culture. Many of you may have come to this talk thinking that this is what it would be about. The so-called cancellation of professors who take controversial positions or employ unsettling methods in the classroom or otherwise act in ways that are not sufficiently woke makes up the bulk of media coverage of academic freedom uh, issues today. Articles in the newspaper, press releases from organizations like the Academic Freedom Alliance are most likely to be citing individual cases like these as their evidence for some unprecedented crisis for academic freedom. A headline in the Wall Street Journal said, academic freedom is withering, citing as examples the quote, 65 instances of professors being disciplined or fired for protected speech that had been recorded by the National Association of Scholars, a conservative advocacy group. The biggest academic freedom stories of recent weeks the ones you've read about in the newspaper are all cases like this. It's that of MIT canceling a talk of a Chicago professor after protests of his published views on affirmative action. Or the case of a, a prominent composer at Michigan who stepped away from teaching after facing significant backlash for showing Laurence Olivier's blackface per, uh, portrayal of Othello in class. I just want to be clear, if people are getting canceled because students are upset about unrelated and fully protected statements of academic views, uh, that's a problem. If universities aren't protecting somebody for a legitimate pedagogical choice they make in the classroom, that's a dereliction of their duties. I'm putting cancel culture in the distractions pile, not because I think there are serious violations happening out there in the world, but some of the most prominent stories break down under scrutiny, and the fairly breathless conclusions that sometimes get drawn from the data in this area often end up being overblown. Compared to the much bigger threat I'm about to discuss, the individual cases that get all the press seem to me to be a distraction. So consider a new database that was just released by FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. They compiled all the examples they could find of university faculty and researchers being targeted for their speech. From 2015 through the first half of this year, FIRE found 426 incidents where calls were made for the speakers to be sanctioned by their academic institutions. FIRE's uh, press releases claimed that protests like these are on the rise, that most come from students, most come from the left, and that three quarters of these protests result in, quote, some form of sanction. Well, that all sounds concerning, so I decided to dive in and see how the University of California had fared. According to FIRE's database, 16 UC scholars were targeted in the last six and a half years. Nine at UCLA, two here and at Berkeley, and one each at Merced, Riverside, and Santa Barbara. The way FIRE codes the case, Five of the 16 scholars were fired, one had a course canceled, four faced investigation, and the remaining six, the university did nothing at all. So I went ahead and looked at the cases myself, and I would have coded three of the 10 sanction cases differently. In one, out of UCLA, the scholar wasn't fired from UC. He was pressured to step down from his editorial position at the Journal of the American Medical Association, a private entity. This obviously has nothing to do with universities caving under public pressure. Another one or two of the cases involve investigations that I think would be misleading to describe as sanctions. In the UCSB case, the university just said it would review Title IX complaints that had been filed against a grad student as of course it must under the law when a Title IX complaint gets filed. In a case on this campus, 
Fire itself wrote a press release at the time the case happened with the headline, quote, UC Davis confirms professor will not be investigated for years old tweets. Although our colleague who is involved in that case disagrees with me about this, I view the investigation there as more of a review by university counsel made in order to confirm that the speech in question was indeed protected. This, I think, is exactly the kind of response to outside pressure we'd want and academic freedom champions should want to see. All told then, in six and a half years, assuming the rest of the data are correct, a total of seven academics at UC faced some form of sanction for their speech. If my math is right, that's one hundredth of a percent of the academic appointees in the UC system right now. One in 10,000 in six and a half years. I can't say I see that as a crisis. Again, that's not to diminish the importance of any academic freedom violations that have occurred, especially the people involved. But I do want to point out that FIRE's database doesn't include instances where academics are targeted and harassed, often by highly organized outside organizations. They don't include it so long as the harassment doesn't include calls for institutional sanction. By putting all this in the distraction column, my point is just this. The hand-wringing about cancel culture, the chilling effects of cancel culture, of students waging campaigns against their professors, distracts us from what are surely the vastly larger chilling effects caused by a form of student speech which the university actually facilitates. And here, I'm talking about student teaching evaluations. So if, as I've been arguing, the central principle of academic freedom is that teaching and scholarship in the university is to be judged by our disciplinary peers, then outsourcing the evaluation of teaching to someone other than disciplinary experts, students for example, is clearly a violation of academic freedom. Now that's not to say that asking students about their experiences in class can't produce incredibly valuable information. As an input to peer evaluation of teaching, one consideration among others, surveys of students are obviously incredibly important. But when the scores and comments from students make up the bulk or even the entirety of an advancement file, judgments about pedagogical effectiveness and scholarly rigor in the classroom have been handed over to a group of people who aren't likely to have expertise about either. Now the problem with student evaluations are well known and I'm not gonna rehearse them here. Study after study shows their adverse effects on women, on non-white faculty, even on less attractive faculty. There may be legal problems with using metrics known to have such biases when making employment decisions. My concern is different. It's that outsourcing evaluations of teaching quality to people other than disciplinary experts is sure to skew what gets taught and how. So within my field, law, I don't personally know a single law professor who's been canceled, but I do know criminal law professors who've stopped teaching rape law, or professors who've stopped assigning group work or cold calling their students, or who've made decisions about the testing format they'll use or laptop policies, all based on student preferences as reflected in their end of semester teaching evaluations, and because of ways that my non-white and female colleagues tend to be evaluated differently than I am, I know many of them feel even more constrained in the ways they feel permitted to present themselves in class. Because their scores are likely to hinge on it, many feel less able to show vulnerability or to use humor, especially self-deprecating humor, or to admit when they don't know something, thereby modeling the virtue of academic humility for their students. Were they to do this, they know their mastery of subject score would surely plummet. Now, of course, the very idea that students encountering a subject for the first time would be asked to judge their professor's mastery of it is actually quite baffling. Universities are increasingly aware of these problems. Within the past couple years, committees have been formed both here at UC Davis and at the system-wide level to examine the role of student evaluations uh, the role they should play and the forms they should take. The Davis Report recommends that we talk about the student experience of teaching rather than student evaluations of teaching. 
It promotes a culture change from teaching evaluation as summative for the purpose of merit and promotion to also being formative, something used for instructors to develop their teaching skills. It calls for more localized, discipline-specific tailoring of standards, something you'll recall I also thought was crucial in the context of DEI statements. And like the system-wide report as well, the Davis Committee, which full disclosure I was on, recommends, quote, robust additional forms of evaluation, like peer observations and reflective teaching statements when faculty are being assessed. In fact, here at UC, system-wide policies, section 210D of the Academic Personnel Manual, dictate that, quote, more than one kind of evidence of teaching effectiveness shall accompany each review file. But a 2019 report from the UC Teaching and Learning Centers says that despite this, numerical student evaluations of teaching are frequently the only form of evidence required or provided for merit and promotion cases across the UC, unquote. To the extent this is true, I count this as an academic freedom failure. And it's one that has effects and operates on a scale that cancel culture's proponents could only dream of. So, DEI statements, US news rankings, cancel culture, student teaching evaluations, what's next? For my last two, I'm gonna to turn to the law for a moment and describe for you a distraction that I actually think has become a danger. The most important recent legal opinion on academic freedom comes out of the Sixth Circuit, the Federal Court of Appeals for Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio, and Tennessee. In Meriwether v. Hartop, decided this March, the Sixth Circuit held that a philosophy professor at a public university had an academic freedom right to refuse to call one of his transgender female students Ms. So-and-so, or to use she, her pronouns, as he did for all the other female students in his political philosophy class. In bringing his First Amendment claim against the university, Professor Merriweather said he feared being, quote, fired or suspended without pay if he does not tow the university's line on gender identity. In light of his fears, he said he cannot address, quote, a high profile issue of public concern that has significant philosophical implications. Unfortunately, the court's opinion was basically a uh, non-contextual greatest hits compilation of all the Supreme Court's uh, most praising sentences of academic freedom. We're told it's a special concern of the First Amendment since the classroom is, quote, peculiar, peculiarly, I can never say that word, the marketplace of ideas. Robert Post's talk in this series actually explained why that statement is absolutely false. Quote, when the state stifles a professor's viewpoint on a matter of public import, much more than the professor's rights are at stake, the Sixth Circuit said, our nation's future depends upon leaders trained through wide exposure to the robust exchange of ideas, not through the authoritative compulsion of orthodox speech. The court concluded, if professors lacked free speech protections when teaching, a university president could require a pacifist to declare that war is just, a civil rights icon to condemn the freedom riders, a believer to deny the existence of God. That cannot be. In May, I helped write and coordinate a friend of the court brief from a group of 101 law professors asking the court to reconsider its decision. Uh, we were unsuccessful. Far from being a, quote, special concern of the First Amendment or something on which our nation's future depend, Meriwether's academic freedom claim was a distraction, we argued. In fact, a distortion of what true academic freedom means. As we wrote in the brief, in the context of teaching, academic freedom protects professors' right to make pedagogical judgments informed by their scholarly expertise about how best to discuss issues that are relevant to the courses they've been hired to teach. All three of those restrictions were lacking in this case. Meriwether had uh, pedagogical reasons for using honorifics in general in class, for calling on his students Mr. and Ms. so-and-so, but he didn't have pedagogical reasons for calling his transgender students Sir or Mr., or to use no honorific at all. He had political or religious reasons for doing so. Furthermore, 
Modes of address aren't necessarily discussions of gender. They're a form of gender-based disparate treatment. And even if that last point is wrong, even if we were to assume that Meriwether was expressing a view on gender every single time he called on that student, that repeated statement of his views in presumably every class, no matter its topic, would hardly be relevant to the course. For these three reasons, this case just had nothing to do with academic freedom. And personally, I've been shocked that conservatives, like the author of the Meriwether opinion itself, don't realize what a threat the opinion's uncabined view of academic freedom poses. If professors at public schools have a First Amendment right to express their religious or political views in class as often as they want, no matter the subject of the class, there would be nothing to check the conservative nightmare of a liberal professoriate constantly working to indoctrinate the students. Imagine if every time I called on one of my more conservative students, let's say a member of the Federalist Society, I prefaced my question with a quick diatribe about the harmful effects FedSoc has had on the federal courts. Surely this would be inappropriate and should be unprotected, even if the diatribes are loosely related to my course's topic, if they're based on my deeply held political beliefs, or even if they're on a matter of public concern, as they surely are. The Meriwether opinion's view of academic freedom is one that would shield me from discipline and tie the university's hands even if I were to act as inappropriately as that. Meriwether is a case that treats academic freedom as just free speech for professors. I've already said that's not what free academic freedom means. And that's why Meriwether's complaint, which I think is him either saying, I can't treat my trans students differently than my cis gender students, or I can't keep bringing up my theories of gender in any class I want, I think that's a distraction. That complaint is a distraction from an academic freedom standpoint. But I think the Sixth Circuit's treatment of that complaint is a danger, and it's actually a pretty fundamental one. In part, the danger is political. If we started treating academic freedom like the Sixth Circuit did, and permitting the kind of political speech untethered to pedagogical concerns that Meriwether protects, academic freedom is likely to lose what public support it still has. Legislators and voters aren't going to be happy about the potential for indoctrination. And there's no good reason why professors should be able to bring personal political and religious views into the workplace in ways that ordinary public employees cannot. I think the danger is not just a political one in Meriwether, though, but also a more theoretical one, in that the Meriwether conception of academic freedom undermines something academ uh, absolutely central to the concept. And this, I'll just say, is the last of the dangers I'm going to be talking about today. Here at UC Davis, our Senate Committee on Academic Freedom is actually called CAFR, the Committee on Academic Freedom and Responsibility. And that's exactly how it should be. The committee's name emphasizes what the Meriwether Court ignores. The fact that academic freedom rights all come with corresponding responsibilities. University teachers enjoy incredible leeway in using their scholarly and pedagogical expertise to make decisions about what and how to teach. We're given an enormous power to judge things that our students and our colleagues write and say. But these judgments have to be based on our disciplinary expertise, not our free-floating political or moral or religious beliefs, much less our own personal biases. As we saw in the discussion of diversity statements, the viewpoint discrimination we're given the liberty to employ when making the judgments necessary for good instruction, for admissions, for hiring, and for tenure and advancement, that comes with a major constraint that we're employing criteria relevant to our class, to the job at hand, to the field. The Meriwether Court's conception of academic freedom without responsibility omits any need to limit our in-class expression to that which is pedagogically relevant and substantively sound. I want to generalize this point. If, as I keep saying, academic freedom is a freedom to have one's academic work judged by other experts in the discipline, not by administrators, students, donors, politicians, 
defunct news magazines or an outraged public. This whole system depends on the good faith, well-considered judgments of those other experts in your discipline. This, it has to be said, is a tough ask. Doing it right imposes onerous demands. At so many points and in so many ways, the temptation to use proxies for quality rather than engaging in general, ge genuine peer review is a strong one, given all the other demands on our time at work and at home, not least during a pandemic. Judging faculty candidates by their schools or the names of their recommenders, judging them and our colleagues by the number of words in their articles or the placement of the articles rather than their content, Outsourcing these decisions to students, relying on student evaluation scores rather than peer visits when we're evaluating teachers. Looking at demographics and catchphrases rather than past actions and clear plans when evaluating contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusion. These are all failures of academic responsibility and therefore all threats to academic freedom. While we need to underscore the review in peer review and acknowledge and hopefully give space and support for the heavy demands it imposes on faculty, we also have to underscore the peer in peer review. If a university's core missions of teaching, research, and the public dissemination of knowledge get entrusted ever, ever more to a precarious workforce of scholars who aren't treated as peers, academic freedom becomes a sometime thing, not a defining feature of the university. The longtime chair of the AAUP's Committee A on Academic Freedom and Tenure, Hank Reichman, who I think and hope is in the audience online today, and whose work and books on academic freedom, including a new one just out, is absolutely essential, Hank has repeatedly claimed that the adjunctification of the university is the greatest present threat to academic freedom. I'll just quote him. Compelling allegedly adjunct faculty to cobble together the semblance of a career from a series of part-time jobs is not only an unconscionable abuse of those colleagues, but also an ominous threat to the academic freedom of all faculty members and, indeed, to the integrity and quality of higher education in general. I say this, of course, at a fraught time here at the University of California. Our non-Senate faculty colleagues, the lecturers represented by UCAFT, have authorized a strike in their ongoing negotiations with the Office of the President. I'm hardly the most knowledgeable person in this room about most of the issues that divide the two sides. So I'm just going to say something about the stakes for academic freedom. First, just to clarify, lecturers at the University of California have the same academic freedom in their teaching and research as I or any other Senate faculty member has. We're all protected under the exact same policy, APM 010. For two years now, a new policy, APM 011, which I was very proud to help draft, has extended protections to non-faculty academic appointees, like librarians, when they're engaged in teaching, research, and other professional activities, uh, when there's nationally recognized professional standards applicable. So in principle, everything I've said today about academic freedom applies to my colleagues who have the word lecturer in their title to the exact same extent as those with professor before their name. It's harder though to see how these paper protections get put into practice for the over 6,000 lecturers in the system who together teach something like a third of our undergraduate courses. Lecturers get job security after they pass an excellence review after six years of teaching, but before that they have currently term-by-term -term employment, and turnover has been reported to be around 25%. The length of these appointments is part of the current negotiations, but importantly and relevantly here, so too is the presence, or currently the absence, of a formal review of pre-six lecturers' work. You probably know what I'm going to say by now but I'll say it anyway. If peer review is a necessary condition of academic freedom in teaching and research, then a sizable chunk of our faculty doesn't currently enjoy actual academic freedom. 
This isn't a case where some peer evaluations are said to be conducted in an ideological narrow way, as is alleged with diversity statements. It's not a case where some individual professors have lost their jobs for reasons other than unprofessional performance, the stuff of the cancel culture stories that dominate the press. This is a case of thousands of faculty keeping or losing their positions without having been afforded peer review of their actual teaching. That's what I think a real threat to academic freedom looks like. I should just point out the way that these are mutually in reinforcing dangers. Uh, I said before that the average salary of professors counts for 7% uh, of the US News undergraduate rankings, so it helps to pay your professors a lot. At the same time, US News gives 8% to the size of classes, so we need a lot of instructors. What's the solution? Well, having non-professors teaching classes. The fact that the ratio of part-time to full-time faculty only counts for 1% of the new US News ranking means schools can take this solution without taking much of a hit. This is yet another cost of outsourcing academic decision-making priorities to US News. That's a bleak way to end, and I'm not by nature a bleak person. So I'll just say this. Unlike some of the threats that I've called distractions, for example, a general culture of intolerance imposing its orthodoxy on the marketplace of ideas at the university, the threats that I've identified as true dangers are ones that we faculty have a real ability to control. We don't need to rely on others to make our academic judgments. It's, of course, a lot more work when we do it ourselves, and I'm not meaning to underemphasize the burdens, but we all know that the best way to get work done is sometimes just to avoid distractions. So thanks again for engaging me, with me today. I'm really grateful. Thank you, Professor Suchik, for a wonderful talk, very rich. I'm sure there are going to be a number of questions, both from our audience here and uh, in the uh, virtual space, and we have a way of conveying those, but let me look first to see if there is a question here. Yeah, Martin. Yeah, so uh, US News and World Report and all these ranking systems, I, I agree with you. Perhaps we shouldn't use them, but I think they've become a reality. It's not so easy to, to sort of say, well, we shouldn't use them. I think uh, today, you know, decisions by undergraduates, by their parents, blah, 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 have become so powerful. And in a sense, we're trapped by them. And I, and I don't know how, you know, you, you can, how you uh, sort of square that circle. Right. Well, of course, the uh, transparency of data that a system like U.S. News provides, I have no objection to, right? The fact that people should know, we put it on our website, our bar passage rate, our employment rate a year after graduation, perhaps even the LSAT and median uh, GPA, those kinds of things, none of that is problematic. The only thing that outsources the relevant academic judgments is the ranking itself and the fairly arbitrary percentage point system of what goes in uh, to making that, which of course changes each year, and this year in the law rankings changed within hours of them being released, causing a whole reshuffling of the entire industry. Uh, that's the part where that causes people to be making, you know, really outsourcing these sorts of decisions. Uh, that's to say that you know, it's, it's not that U.S. news has to evaporate, but it would require a change in, in how, they're, how they're used. I, I realize that compared to some of the others, that is less in our control, given that uh, we would need... Uh, the people that have gone it alone, the Reed Colleges of the world, uh, have suffered for doing so. And statisticians have demonstrated ex exactly to what extent they've suffered in the rankings for doing so. Um, I, I'm wondering why the attacks on 
critical race theory haven't been used so much as academic freedom issues? And, and when do you think, and I've been thinking a lot about this, when did the attacks on critical race theory start coming at the university level? Yeah, uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, one thing I said, uh, be, I think before you arrived, was that I was going to try to focus on academic freedom dangers at the most privileged of places, uh, where we've got a supportive legislature and relatively good resources uh, compared to those places where the legislature is coming for tenure, where it's coming for critical race uh, teaching and, in fact, all divisive concepts, uh, that sort of thing. And that's not in any way to slight those as problems. Those, are, uh, those would be on my dangers list to be sure. Uh, the, the thought of a legislature trying to interfere with what's taught at the university is the very definition of what of, a, of an academic freedom violation as, as I've defined it. So yeah, the fact that I was focusing here on the fact that even at places like this, it's said that we're in an academic, a time of academic freedom crisis why is that? What does that mean? You know, despite the fact that our legislature isn't coming after our critical race teaching colleagues, um, thankfully, since that's most of our colleagues. I, uh, I will say one thing that on that, though, which is I think a lot of the distractions have a political cost that's directly relevant to what you're talking about. That the crisis narrative itself, especially as it arises from cancel culture and that sort of thing, especially the way it's framed as a culture arising from an intolerant uh, culture of students coming from the left that demands a sort of orthodoxy, that crisis narrative has given rise to legislative interventions. That's the sort of narrative. Those are the studies that legislators point to when they say, we need to get involved in this public education system in Florida or in Iowa or in Texas or Oklahoma. Uh, because just look at the study about how students don't feel safe to speak, to express themselves as conservatives. So we're going to start having surveys and manage what gets taught and that kind of thing. So I think there's a real danger even from academic, from organizations devoted to promoting academic freedom, the way they frame their studies, the kinds of press releases that they issue, can actually prompt further threats and worse threats to academic freedom from above. Right, so the most recent thing that I read, the most recent press release I read from the University of Florida uh, emphasized the fact that these were full-time uh, employees asking permission uh, or reporting outside paid labor, outside paid work, which, you know, of course, we, we file such reports every year uh, for any outside paid activities that we engage in. The problem, of course, is that under the First Amendment, you could have a policy saying that I can't do any outside labor, but you can't pick and choose what outside labor I do based on the viewpoint I'm going to express as part of that labor. It's just a blatant First Amendment uh, violation. I, for me, it's almost easy, it's, it's far easier to see it just in straight up First Amendment terms as, of the same for any government employee as opposed to some specifically academic freedom type issue. These are just professors speaking on their own time uh, and angering higher ups in the government as they do so. That's the definition of First Amendment retaliation. Is there a question from the virtual world? <laughs> uh, so Jonathan asks, would you consider the problems with outsourcing university rankings to be similar to problems with using impact factor of journals to judge quality of the work of academics? In other words, do you consider things like impact factor of journals to be another form of outsourcing evaluation? Yeah, that's a really great question. Did everybody in the virtual world hear you, Emily? Are you mic'd? 
Uh, the question was whether impact scores, uh, it, you know, scores that evaluate the impact of your scholarship that then get incorporated into rankings of various faculties is a type of outsourcing like what I complained about in US News. And it's a great question because on the one hand, it seems better than outsourcing to US News because we're not looking to some random employees at a private magazine. We're actually looking to how are people in the field using your work. So that's a big step up. On the other hand, of course, using impact rankings is going to have effects like, for example, uh, within my field, the number of people who read constitutional law scholarship is vastly larger than the number of people that read feminist scholarship or tax scholarship. And so if what we're looking at is just an impact rating, the number of citations, when you look at the top 20 cited scholars in each of those subfields within the law, rankings have been coming out on uh, Brian Leiter's blog recently where he does just that. And uh, my dean was recently at the top of one of those lists. If you look at the list that, uh, that Kevin was on and compare it, say, to the list of people in constitutional law, you know, you could be 20th in the con law list and be dominating the tax list or something like that. So these kinds of metrics do have a similar kind of outsourcing effect in the sense that it provides a strong incentive for schools that want to maximize their ratings in these peer impact scores to really be emphasizing the hiring of faculty that are in the high citation subfields. De-emphasize, you know, fewer tax scholars, more of... <laughs> more of people in my field? It's a great question. Question there? Sure. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, um, so I was wondering, uh, you know, uh, obviously students play a huge role in defining the limits of how a professor can choose to teach within their classroom. And I was wondering, um, as we play such a substantial role in this ongoing situation, is there a way for us to fit into the dialogue, not as like arbiters for you know, here's how you teach, but rather as enablers for allowing that sort of free speech and within the, the professors. Yeah, very much so, because one thing that my colleagues on the faculty aren't especially well equipped to judge when they give peer evaluations of my teaching, let me say the other, they are very well equipped to judge the pedagogy, the substance of what I say, you know, do I know what I'm talking about when I teach you civil procedure, that kind of thing. They're quite good at that. They're less good at knowing whether you feel respected in my classroom, uh, whether I'm going above and beyond when it comes to office hours and meeting with you about your midterms, that sort of thing. You know, they're not there for that. Uh, those are the kinds of things, you know, how clear are my how, how clear is the organization of my class? They can look at my syllabus and that's something that's a good part of peer assessments, but uh, you're the one who's actually experiencing it. And so the Davis Committee's call for moving from student evaluation of teaching to student experience of teaching is getting at exactly what you're asking. It's let's ask questions where we can benefit from uh, the student perspective about what they experienced in the classroom this past semester uh, and then that can be incorporated into what my peers on the faculty are able to see or know about, you know, am I teaching you the right kinds of things? Am I having good effects on you down the line? You know, when you go to upper level classes, do you seem like you know what you're talking about after having had me? That kind of thing. Uh, so it would be those two things working together. You see why? Okay, so in a situation like that, since your argument was that it should be, um, or at least what I understood it was, it should kind of be department by department, whether um, DEI statements are something important and relevant to the material you're dealing with and stuff, how do you, I guess, reconcile that with um, something like a UCY? Uh, yeah, very good. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't clarify this, so thanks for giving me the chance to. I have no problem with a university-wide or a top-down mandate, meaning we're going to require these statements as part of your application for new faculty or your advancement file for current faculty as we get tenure or go for a promotion. That's fine with me. That's what we do with other 
aspects of the application. We tell you what to report. Uh, what would be problematic is how that gets evaluated. So, you know, we might ask everybody within the system to have the following four components every time they go up for tenure or a raise. That's fine, but of course, how you evaluate the teaching, scholarship, and service is going to look very different in the chemistry department than in the School of Law. You know, so we're quite used to the idea that teaching and mentorship and research in general is going to be evaluated very differently in theater than in sociology and you know, the veterinary school, et cetera, right? Nobody, that's not strange to anybody. And yet suddenly with diversity statements, sometimes it's seen, because it's not seen as tied as an inherent part of somebody's job description, their teaching, service, and research, it's seen as something extra or extraneous, then the thought is that it could be somehow standardized across the university. But that's just not true. What it means in my, my life as a philosopher of art, what it means to contribute to diversity, equity, and inclusion is quite different than what it means in, in the law school. You know, within philosophy of art, for example, we're thinking about what artworks are we using as examples? You know, how are we diversifying the set of philosophers or just the very issues that we're bringing up as philosophically relevant questions in class? Whereas, you know, I'm over here doing amicus work or stuff like that in order, you know, that has DEI implications within law. Thanks. Now we have another question. Virtual space. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay. We're running on time, so this might have to be our last question. Um, and it's from Hank, who you gave a shout out to. <laughs> um, he says, thank you, Brian, for a terrific talk and for your kind reference to my own work. You correctly note the, the connection between academic freedom and responsibility. But given your focus in the talk on institutions that are, with respect to academic freedom, most privileged, what do you believe are the responsibilities of faculty members in institutions like the UC, or even more privileged, say the Ivies, are to the defense of academic freedom in higher education more generally? Mm. Yeah. That's, that, 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 that's a tough one, Hank. Um, and I'm glad to hear that you're, you're here. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, aside from joining the AAUP or doing work like that, like, like Hank himself has, has long done, uh, that kind of solidarity is, is certainly important. Um, you know, in, I think institutions of privilege, as you say, like the University of California and even more so like the Ivies, uh, swallow up a vastly disproportionate share of the coverage of these kinds of issues. Uh, the, the sorts of, the, the tempest in the teapot at Yale Law School each week, you know, is, is dominant. I, I see more in my news feeds uh, about a, a DEI controversy among kind of low-level administrators at the Yale Law School than I've seen about uh, you know some of the more serious threats, including the kinds of restrictions on teaching critical race theory and other quote-unquote divisive concepts. The thing that Dean Johnson was referring to, uh, and th that's where we're losing the focus. And so in reorienting us here at even a place of privilege from the very individualized kinds of disputes that tend to dominate the press to these more systemic issues of how we do our responsibilities uh, in order to promote academic freedom, those are, I think those are more transportable problems. They're problems that, uh, where we have a lot more in common uh, with people at other places ultimately. But, it's absolutely the case that uh, we, and especially those who are covering us in the press, uh, need not to get distracted by the, the, flashy, uh, the flashy controversies at the, the top of the higher ed food chain. Well, we have reached 4.30, and I know that there might be other questions, and I certainly have some in my mind, but I want to respect everyone's time, and Professor Sutton said thank you for an extraordinary talk. For those of us who are here in the alumni uh, center, there is a small reception outside, and uh, we can um, trouble you more with our questions there. But let's give Professor Sochek quite a round of applause. Thanks, everybody online, for joining as well. Thank you all.